They were talking about chip formation and CNC machining. I'm just going to turn to this. All right. Everybody's here. Does that capture the whole screen? Perfect. Does it capture me? All right, perfect. Um, I guess since I'm no longer listening to my get psyched music. What do you, so I've asked you this before, right? What do you do if you're ready for class? What do you do to make sure you're going to stay awake during class? Listen to music? All right. What are you listening to? Share. What's that? Oh, listen to music? Yeah. So what are you listening to? Yeah. I don't think you want me to sing. <laughs> Look at that. All I got to do is hit the table. Do you guys see this one already? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it turns out people watch a YouTube video longer if it has cool music. People say that. Is that cool music or what? Yeah. All right. Quick recap. Quick recap. All right. Energy is the ability to work, right? Is that right? Kids need to be more dynamic, more involved. You know why you fall asleep in class? Because you're not more involved. Be more involved. Energy is the ability to do work. Power equals work over time, right? Power is work over time. Power is current times voltage. Is that true? We didn't really say that. Somebody may have said it yesterday, right? But power is current times voltage. And that's how we get that meter on the machine tool, right? That's how that meter that goes up to, what, 200%? That's how that gets its information. So we're measuring power there. Now, is that the same as the power that's at the chip? No. What's, what's, what's the difference between that power at the machine tool? Anybody look at the machinery's handbook yet? I showed it to you yesterday. So you've looked at it. I held it up in front of the room. Anybody go download it yet? Check it out. Nobody's uber excited yet. The machinery's handbook is your friend. It doesn't just tell you how to estimate power for machining. It tells you thousands of other pages worth of stuff, too. Uh, you guys should, uh, should be excited about that. But power is current times voltage. And it's force times velocity. Is this true? So current times voltage equals force times velocity? That's kind of cool. Um, What's the velocity equal? Yeah. Uh, speed the, the velocity equals the surface speed, right? Get this thing on. Document camera, go. Well, this could be exciting. It like always starts because it was like warming up and then I press the power button and turn it off. Nope, power button's turning it on, I believe. Maybe. There we go. Power button's turning on. Ooh. You guys don't need to. Do I need to amplify my voice for you? Okay, good. If I do, it means I've fallen asleep. Okay, uh, where are we? Well, the question was, what's the velocity, right? And the answer was, the velocity is the surface speed. It is not focused. It is not pointed at the whole board. Whoa. Auto focus. It's 
magic. Service speed, right? What does service speed equal? Somebody else. Somebody else. So it, it's generated by the rotation of the spindle. So the spindle does its roundy round stuff, right? So what's service speed equal to? It comes from the spindle. Yes. You had your hand up, right, Robert? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it would be the, would be the relative velocity of, the, of, of a point. Of a point on the spindle. Or on the, on the cutting tool, probably. If it's a milling machine, it would be on the cutting tool. If it's a, if it's a lathe, it would be the workpiece rotation because the lathe, the workpiece is attached to the spindle. It is the relative velocity between the cutting edge of the tool and the workpiece. Surface speed is the relative velocity between the cutting edge of the tool and the workpiece. We usually discount the portion of surface speed that comes from the feed. Because the portion of surface speed that comes from the rotation of the spindle is always ginormous compared to the portion of the surface speed that comes with the feed. So we just don't care about the feed part. Okay, so it's that velocity, right? Power equals force times velocity. What's the force? One thing, force is a vector, right? Power is a vector, or sorry, uh, velocity is a vector, right? So if you want to multiply two vectors by each other, they have to be in the same direction? Not necessarily, but the, pro the, the magnitude of this by the force that is lined up in that direction is the power that we're talking about. That's the power of the chip. All right, so that's going to be important to us later today. Um, I'm good, I'm good. Power, all right, so we can estimate power, right? You need this one though now, P, C. So we can estimate the power. We estimate the power based on some material specific power constant, right? So a specific energy for cutting for this material. We have a feed rate fudge factor because they noted when they did the experiments that if you had faster feed rates, you got different results. We have material removal rate. This is the, the rate at which we're making that chip. It's volume over time. And we have a tool wear or tool sharpness factor. And if we know those things, we can estimate how much power it's going to take to make a cut. That's the power at the chip, right? What if we want to know the power at the spindle? Well, there's power going to the spindle, otherwise we're not spinning the spindle. So we need one more factor. We could call that factor. I really just want to write on the whiteboard right now. Just want to add, wait, wait, no, I can do that. Screen up. And we need, I think it's E. And that is, Machine tool efficiency. Except I can't spell. One term. First day of class, I'm writing something on the board, I spell it wrong. Did I ever mention to you guys that I don't know how to spell? And I'm not interested in learning how to spell. But one of the kids in the class, he says, hey, you spelled that wrong. And so I took the red marker and I threw it to him. I said, you will be the red squiggly for the rest of the term. And I, I thought I was joking. He did it. The whole rest of the term, when I'd spell something wrong, he would go draw a red squiggly under it. It was pretty cool. Cool for me, anyway. I don't know if it was cool for the rest of the class. All right, so we can estimate power. Um, and again, it's power at the chip, right? It's power at the chip. So what, what does that chip look like? Let's figure it out. We want to estimate the power at the chip. Let's, let's understand that chip just a little bit. Document camera back on. All right. So, 
so let's make a chip. Maybe I will have that screen go back down. Is the screen going down? Okay, good. Screen's going down. I have my workpiece material. It's fixtured in a uh, experimental fixture here. Let's autofocus again, maybe, and get it to focus right here. Can you guys see that? Maybe we zoom a little bit. And autofocus again one more time. All right, so I have three different workpiece materials here with three different material conditions. Let's watch that chip form. So I got my cutting tool here, right? You guys have seen, you guys seen one of these before? You've been at the lathe, you, uh, in the initial engraving, you use the lathe, right? Have you guys started doing the, uh, the cylinder machining yet? No? Anybody? That must be coming this week. All right, so um, we have our cutting insert. We've got our workpiece material. I'm going to move my other workpiece. And so let's make a chip. All right, do you guys see the chip form? So that was one workpiece condition. All right, new workpiece condition. Let's make a chip. So I'm trying to keep the feed, speed, and depth of cut the same, right? Because when we do an experiment, we want to keep one independent variable, right? Okay. At least it's easier to draw the graph. If you have two independent variables, what do you have to have? Is that mine? Okay, good, because I swore I put mine on do not disturb before I walked in the room. Uh, so what do I got to... If I have two um, independent variables, what do I have to do to plot the results? I have to have some sort of a three-axis graph, right? Okay, we don't want to have a three-axis graph. Anybody? Good. All right, so my second material condition. So try to keep the feed, speed, and depth of cut the same. No, I just screwed up depth of cut. Did the chip look different? Because I can't really see from this side. All right, that's material condition number two. I have material condition number three. And so effectively what I'm doing here is I'm changing that KP value. I'm changing how much energy it takes to make that chip by changing the material conditions. Now here it's all one material at different temperatures. This is room temperature. This one just came out of the refrigerator. This one just came out of the freezer. Heat speed depth to cut the same. Chip look different? Yeah. What you don't know is it took a lot more force to do that last one. I, I was trying to figure out how to do this with a force sensor involved. Make a note. We're going to add a force sensor to this experiment so we can actually measure the cutting force because you don't know. Well, it's butter, by the way. Butter makes everything better. All right. So you can do this at home. Have you ever taken a stick of butter and you want to get, like, especially if it just came out of the fridge, you, but you still want to butter your toast? And so if you slice a pad of butter off, you, you get partway through it, it just breaks off if it's really cold, right? And so what you've done is you've initiated a crack and it has fractured. We want to avoid doing that when we're doing our CNC machining because then we have very little control over where the surface ends up. But, so what do you do if you want to control that? If the butter's too cold, you take the butter knife and you go across the top, right? Some people just do that as their normal method. That, that weirds me out when I go to somebody's house and I get the butter dish. And like the butter is like flat and it's like, and it's like dished out. That weirds me out. Because I grew up in a house where we cut the butter off from the end, right? So, but some people do that normally. But if you do that, if you take that butter knife and scrape it across the top, 
you can see the chip form. If you change the angle of the butter knife, when you scrape it across the top, you're going to see the chip form differently. So you can have, and so, um, and so in chip formation, if we go back to the PC here for a second, and I think you guys have seen this video. I think I've played it before, but let's, uh, let's go through and look at it again. Did I, did I tell you that I like butter? Makes everything better? It, did you know that that may be genetic? I don't know for sure if it is genetic, but um, my youngest daughter, when she's doing something she's not supposed to do, she likes to hide under something. So like under a table, under a bed. Um, she frequently has her mother's iPad, and she's like under the bed watching some, watching the stupid Minecraft thing that like, why, why do you watch other people play video games? Especially if you don't play the video game, right? So one day I come in the living room, and she is under the coffee table. She was little then, under the coffee table. I said, what are you doing? Nothing. Which, as a parent, I have learned means something. What are you doing? Nothing. No, I mean, really, what are you doing? Nothing. So she is under the coffee table. It says, I was bigger than her. I picked it up and moved it. And there she is in a little ball with a stick of butter that she's eating like it's a candy bar. <laughs> butter does make everything better, and uh, people that believe that, it's probably genetic. Okay, so back to chips. <clears throat> when is the last time that your professor got under the table to emphasize a point in any lecture you've been to? You will remember this lecture. I win. And I, did, I told you about the guy that took his clothes off, right? I didn't even have to take my clothes off. You will remember at least that part of the lecture. Chips. All right. Let's watch this video. Let's talk about how the chip forms in watching this video. Because here I can see it. On the, the thing here, I couldn't see it. All right. So let's pause right here. What's going on in this picture? First, is it milling or turning? It's turning, right? So we have the work pieces rotating. The tool is coming in. What we're looking at here. Let me back up just a hair. Come on, come on. Let's go full screen. Let's back up just a hair. Come on, come on. Don't need a stupid preview. I don't want to play. I just want to watch. All right. So right now, the workpiece is turning. The tool is not in contact. All right. There's no chip. So the feed is zero. When we started this video, we started the spindle. Then we started the feed. Here, by the way, we're not cutting butter. Black butter. That wouldn't, yeah. If the butter's black, I'm not going to try it. Um, it's, uh, it's some kind of plastic Delrin or something. Um, so this top part of the tool, so when we start feeding sideways into the workpiece, the chip is going to slide along that top part, of what, the, what looks like the top part of the tool here for us. And so here, you guys all see this? So right here, we're looking straight down the cutting edge of the tool, right? And so what this surface right here is the same as this surface right here, right? So that's the rake face of the cutting tool. You're going to want to know that. So that's the rake. And so in, in whether it's turning or milling, when the chip forms at the cutting edge, so the chip always forms at the cutting edge, right? After the chip forms at the cutting edge, the chip slides along the rake face of the tool. So whether it's turning or milling. So in milling, the rake face of the tool is then inside the flutes, right? Because when those milling cutters come around, it's spinning around, the chip forms, and then it goes up and spirals out the flute. You know, those flutes have spirals in order to evacuate the chips out of the hole. Purpose for the spiral is to get the chips out of the way. Okay, so let's watch this as it starts forming. So chip slides along the right face of the tool. In this case, the chip was curling up, right? Plastic tends to do that. It's because this cutting process, it relieves stresses on one side, it has stresses on the other side, and it makes the chip bend up. It happens with steel chips, it happens with aluminum chips. It's just really easy to see in plastic. So here now, we've got the same operation, different view. We're looking straight down like this. 
looking straight down the cutting edge of the tool. Now, I don't want the stupid thing to come up. Oh, you can't see it? Because I'm on the wrong view? Thank you for telling me before we went like five minutes into that. All right, let's watch it here for a second. I'm just going to back it up. Let it come in there. So, stop here. Stop here. Without showing me the more videos. Oh, there we go. That's what I wanted to see. Does that look familiar? That shape, right? It's the same shape that we had with the chip forming on the edge of the butter. It's that chip coming along. It's just a different orientation. Right? Does that make sense? So here, we know that the volume of material being removed impacts how much power it takes, right? And we know how much power it takes impacts the cutting force. Right? That we know this. Okay. So what are the what are the process variables, the independent variables? that we're controlling here that are going to impact how much power it takes or how much force it takes. What could we do to increase the force or decrease the force? Uh, change the rotational speed of the, the workpiece. That would change the rate at which we make the chips. Will it change how much power? Uh, depends on what units you're thinking of for your rotational speed, yeah. So if I change the angle of the cutting tool like this, right? And so if we look at it on um, on the whiteboard, where's my eraser? Eraser. So we look at this on the whiteboard, and I'll have to refocus, I think. Zoom out. Angle up. Focus. And then don't be the thing it focuses on. All right. So let's let's look at this. So our chip eraser is in my hand. That's why I can't find it. All right. So we've got our cutting edge. For our tool, and that's pretty much my uh, my workpiece was over here, right? My finished surface was over here. Here was the cutting edge of my tool, and I was moving the tool in this direction when we did the butter, right? And then the chip slid up along this rake face that's the plane that goes into the board here. So that's what we saw when we cut the butter off the top of the piece. So if I angle the tool this way, so if that's now the angle of the tool, what does the chip have to do? It definitely has to bend more, right? So maybe it starts forming the chip back here, and the chip flows up like that when I angle that. And so, so this angle here, alpha, is called the rake angle. So it's the angle now we could so this would be a negative. And if I angle the tool this way, this would be a positive rake angle. So if I change the rake angle, that's gonna impact the cutting, right? So it turns out, did you know that you can machine glass like this? Like like the window glass kind of glass. If you machine glass like this. As long as you have the right tools, the right feed speed and depth of cut, and a severely negative rake angle, you can make ribbony chips in glass. I have not done it. I have not tried it. But I've seen pictures of it. It's sort of like the internet says. <laughs> no, but I, I believe the people that showed the pictures. OK, so that is what we're seeing as, as we go through this. Let me see. And so there's a couple other things that we'll see here. Did I go back to the, no, I did not go back to the PC. There we are. All right, let's let this finish. Zoom out. And so again, this, our model here is turning. So we've got a feed in this direction. 
we've got a speed in this direction, right? And so our speed, I think it's set to auto replay. All the way up here. No, not quite all the way up there. No, 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 no. Here it is. I see what happened. Okay. So we've got feed rate this way. Speed is because of the rotation of the spindle. We've got a finished diameter, a DF, and an initial diameter and our depth of cut, right? So what's the, uh, what's the volumetric material removal rate from this picture? Volume over time. Um, there's the speed, speed rate um, times the area, um, like the, the depth, the depth, depth the width of the, and the width of the cut, yeah. right? So it would be feed rate times the depth of cut times the width of the cut is our volumetric material removal rate here. OK, let's move on. I wonder if that's going to auto. Well, all right. So let's, let's look at another one of these videos. And so this was taken with a high-speed camera on a microscope and cutting steel. Oops. No, I didn't want to advance the slide. I wanted to play the video. All right, let's play the video. Um, and it was a long time ago. As you can tell from the cool, jittery focus and all that. All right, so here's the, here's the process that they're looking at. They're facing across this piece of steel. When you zoom in, now, no, I don't want to see more videos. I mean, thank you, YouTube, for making other people want to see more videos, but I just want to show this picture. All right, so what do we see here? The tool is moving this direction now, right? But all that is, is now we're like this, right? So it's just a different orientation. We're still looking straight down the cutting edge, and this surface that's moving through the material that's the rake plane in and out of the board. No, thank you. So what do you notice here? Yeah. Um, at the place, like earlier, before uh, it actually detects the sharp part, it's actually crunching up the material. So, right, so the cutting edge hits the material over here, right? Cutting edge comes in contact with the material over here. But you can see the effect of it in the material over here. And so we have, we have two things that we observe here also. So we have this depth right here in this, in this image, right? We call that the uncut chip thickness. That's the material, that's the, the width of material or the thickness of material that we're about to remove. That's the uncut chip thickness. And then we have this here, right? The distance from here to here, that's the chip thickness. What do you notice immediately about the uncut chip thickness and the chip thickness? Yeah. No way. No way. The uncut chip thickness here looks to be about half of what the chip thickness looks like, right? So, but it's the same volume of material, right? The volume of the chip must equal the volume of material that was removed. So what do we do to the material if we make the thickness change but keep the same volume? It is not compressible. We had, I mean, we had to do work on the material, right? So something is happening in the, ma the material over here does not know that the cutting's going on. Right? And the material up here does not know that the cutting's going on. But the material right here at that interface, it totally knows the cutting's happening because that's where all of the energy, remember it takes energy to make these chips? All of the energy that doesn't get turned into heat or noise is being applied to the material 
right at that spot. You can imagine that that plane there is important then in understanding how the chip forms and, and understanding the power. So we call that, and so here in my diagram, that's going to do, this is my first ever video animation. Now, I didn't have any fancy software when I did this. I totally played the video from the DVD with a screen capture thing turned on on my computer to do that. And then when I wanted to rotate it around like this, I put it in a PowerPoint slide, and then I rotated the PowerPoint slide with the screen capture software turned on. Talk about fancy animation. Um, all right, so here we go. Here's our picture. It's getting there. All the lines are coming in. I was, I was, I was very proud of this. Let's go out here. I think right here is about good. Let's pause. All right, so we've got an uncut chip thickness, T1. We call it T1 because it's the uncut chip thickness. It's the first thickness. We've got a cut chip thickness, T2. We call it T2 because it's the next one. Very innovative um, naming. And, and so we've got this chip, and we've got this plane right here, right? Because that's a plane, because the chip has width. Right now we're looking at the thickness, but there is width. What's the width of the chip? From, from looking at this, so here we are. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, here we are. So that's sort of the view we got, right? So we've got thickness. We got an uncut chip thickness and a chip thickness, and we can clearly see that here. What's the width then? It's the distance this way, right, with the depth of cut. So the width of this chip is the depth of cut. All right, so let's move on. All right, so this, uh, people struggle sometimes with this part of the class. And, and I think they struggle with this part of the class, one, because it's the first real math we do. But this math isn't that hard. Who took, um, what's the class, high school, 10th grade? Geometry? Anybody take geometry? High school, 10th grade, 9th grade, whatever. Who took it in 9th grade? I took it in 9th grade. Yeah, we're the smart kids, right? Who was a smart kid in high school? I was totally a smart kid in high school. People, people thought I was like one of the smartest kids in the, in the class. Um, other people thought I was just a smart ass. But so all the people who were smart kids in high school, when you got to WPI, was it harder? No? For me it was. It was way harder. Because I didn't have to do any work in high school to get A's. I just glided through high school. When I got to WPI, hey, I know the technique. Let's just glide through. And not only that, who did the thing where you take the, the calculus class and then you get retroactive credit for the previous calculus classes? Who did it and it failed? Yeah. So it turns out when you take Calc 3 and then you don't do any of the homework because you already know how to do that stuff, you might already know how to do that stuff, but you can't pass the exam in the time allotted because you haven't been practicing because you didn't do any of the damn homework, right? And then you know what happens? You don't get credit for Calc 1 and Calc 2. Not only that, when you take Calc 1 the next term, you're in the Calc 1 with the dumb kids who didn't pass it the first term, right? Yeah, I struggled with math. I took Calc 3 for the third time the term that I graduated. Just saying. Okay. Um, where were we? What are we talking about? We're talking about chips, chip formation, being the smart kid in class. How did I get on smart kid? You guys have to keep me on point here. You have to focus me. How did I get on smart kid? What was just before that? Geometry. Geometry. Yeah, because I took it in ninth grade. I was all proud of myself. <laughs> all right. So the geometry of this chip formation, if you can understand that, then all the rest of it's going to be easy. And so, uh, who remembers the term orthogonal force systems? What, what class are you talking about orthogonal force systems? Physics Calculus. 1? Calculus? Yeah. yeah. Did, um, did you get, when you guys did Calc 3, I think, I remember this from Calc 3, I'm pretty sure one of the assignments was to go find an engineer working in the field and ask them about how they use calculus. 
Anybody have that homework assignment in their calculus class, any of them? No. Nope. They gave us that homework assignment every time I took Calc 3. So they used to do that a lot. And, um, and usually, you'd go, like, I, I'd call my dad. He's a civil engineer. He's like, pile of dirt here needs to be here, right? <laughs> and and <laughs> he, was, he was actually, uh, for a while, he was a combat engineer. And um, I haven't seen it, but I've heard that they actually had a manual for nuclear excavation for when you literally had to move a mountain. Dig a hole, put a backpack nuke in it, set it off, move the mountain. Um, I didn't see it. Might have been just a rumor. But um, all right, so yeah, I called my dad. He's like, I never used calculus. Now, the thing was, he used calculus every day, but he was doing it in his head, right? And I remember the day that I realized that, shit, I just did calculus in my head. Oh, it's all ruined for me. I do use calculus. All right, so we're going to use calculus, but we're going to do the estimate kind. Because they never would have invented calculus if they'd had digital computers. They would have just done the estimate kind. There's no reason to work out all those formulas if you could plug in a thing on your computer and figure out the answer. Um, all right, so geometry, we're going to have to figure those out. What's an orthogonal force system, though? Somebody's <laughs> a dog scratching a niche over there. Right, hitting the wall with their tail or something. The system of forces that. All right, what's what's the word orthogonal mean? I'm pretty sure it means being at a right angle. <laughs> but there could be another dimension out this way, right? But so if this is if this is x and this is y. Right? Then Z must come this way. If we have a right hand coordinate system, if we do our right hand rule where we move our, our, our fingers from X to Y and then the thumb points in the Z direction, right? Was that geometry? Which one was the right hand rule? That's physics. physics? Just physics? I guess it's physics where we, it's, it's physics where we do these, these uh, orthogonal force systems. Now, if I have a force, and let's say, My force is in this direction. And I'm going to call that force P because I call it P in all my slides. Whoa, that's not focused. Oh, it is focused. All right, we're going to call that force P. And um, did I leave enough room for the chip? Yeah. I'm going to move force P to here. Okay. Call that force P. And force P is the force that the tool applies to the chip and or the tool applies to the workpiece. You can look at it either way. That force is applied to the chip workpiece interface. Right? And so we could actually draw a free body. Who remembers free body diagrams? All the hands should go up, right? <laughs> I was I was guest lecturing somebody else's class once, and they were just about to introduce me, but they're handling like questions about Canvas or my WPI, whatever it was they were using at the time. Kid, and it was this room. WPI shirt. What's your name? Yeah. What's it say it again? Rufus. Rufus. So this kid's sitting right about where Rufus is sitting over there. And I don't remember the question, but he asked a really stupid question. Have you ever like said, oh, wait, did that just come out of my mouth kind of moment? Right? So I don't remember what the question was. The professor in charge of the class, he looked at the kid. I'm going to pick on Rufus. This is, Rufus, did you take physics one here? And the kid said, yeah. And he said, you should ask for your money back. Right? So if you didn't learn something in the class, who, whose fault is it? it? It might be yourself, but a little bit. If the teacher didn't inspire you to learn that, but it's a little bit on the person th taught the class, too, I think. So anyway, orthogonal force systems. So let's say, all right, so here's where the, here's the cutting tool. And so this is the tool. This is the rake face in this plane right here, right? Is that a positive or negative rake angle? Positive rake angle, OK. All right, so we like that. So in our rake angle, 
again is alpha. Rake angle is alpha right here. Okay. So our finished surface is coming out that direction, right? Here's our workpiece. Our starting surface is coming from over here, right? And so if I do this, here's my T1. Here's my chip, right? It's sliding along that rake face. Here's my shear angle, or here's my shear plane, in and out like this. Uh, I gotta look at, I just wanna make sure I don't draw the thing in the wrong place. You ever do that? Think you know something and then draw it wrong? Yeah. Here's our shear angle. that phi? That one's phi? Yeah, okay. Our shear angle's phi, our rake angle's alpha, and so we got our T2 here, right? Now what's the width of the chip? Width of the chip is depth of cut, and it's in this orientation, right? Which we can't see in this two-dimensional representation. So we've compressed this onto two dimensions. So I got my resultant force, P. Now, force C was power times velocity, right? Right, we gotta, or do we have to repeat yesterday? Force equals power times velocity, right? Now, the velocity, oh yeah, sorry, whatever. Do the correct one, not the one I said. Power equals force times velocity. Make sure the units cancel. The units would not have canceled the other way. That's the velocity. That velocity comes from what? Surface speed, right? It comes from the rotation of the spindle, whether the tool's in the spindle or the workpiece is in the spindle. That velocity comes from surface speed, so that equals surface speed. Velocity times force, so I need a force lined up this direction, right? I'm going to call that FC. That's the cutting force. Now, does FC equal P? No. But FC plus FT equals P. As long as I drew the things the right length. Right? And so FC and FT are, ortho or are, are orthogonal to each other. Right? So, this comes from spinning the spindle. What does this come from? It comes from the servo motors that are doing the feed and doing the... Um, so, if you didn't have a force in that direction, what would the tool tend to want to do? It would tend to want to leave the workpiece material, right? So when you're, you gotta push the tool into the workpiece material, so there's energy, energy that goes into the feed. Um, so this comes from the feed or uh, the adjacent axis that's pushing up against there. So we've got FC plus FT. But what's happening in the workpiece is happening here, right? We see that in the video. We zoomed in on that on the video. We could see that where we were changing the material was happening in that shear plane. Which means I actually have to have force being applied in that shear plane. Right? I gotta have a force that's applied in the direction of that shear plane in order to shear the material there. And if I and so we're gonna call that F S. So that's the shear force. If I've got that force that's aligned with the shear plane, and I want it to add together to equal P, because remember our orthogonal forces, because because P is the force, P is the resultant force. What do I have to have? If I want it to add together and equal P, what do I have to have? I got to have a force perpendicular to this. And 
And let me just check my thing here. I want to be consistent with the slides. F N. That's the force normal to the shear plane. Because we are engineers, we are not imaginators. So we don't have we're not we're not even marketers. So we can't think of cool names for our forces. F S F N. Okay. So we know and so F S and F N add together to equal P. How do you measure F S? How do you measure that shear force? Could you envision a way to directly measure the shear force? Like we imagined a way to measure the thrust force and the cutting force, right? We could mount a force sensor, a three axis force sensor underneath our tool block. And the forces that get transmitted through that tool block are going to be able to figure out FC and FT. We, could, we talked about that yesterday. We can directly measure those. What if you wanted to measure that FS? Could you imagine a way to directly measure the FS? Wouldn't you have to have a strain gauge here that you're stretching somehow or something like that at the shear plane? So one side of it's attached to the workpiece, one side of it's attached to the chip as the, as the material shearing. Except that moves through the material, right? So you can't do it. So we can't measure FS directly. Would it be cool to have an equation though? to go from maybe FC and FT to FS? Because FS is impacted by our material choice. Right, so there's one more, we got what, 30 seconds left? There's one more orthogonal force system that matters to us here. And it's the one that's aligned with the rake angle. And why does that one matter to us? What's happening as the chip slides along the rake face of the tool? Friction is happening as the chip slides along the rake face of the tool, right? So, and, and it's that friction force. Remember I said, as you're doing this cutting, if you didn't have that thrust force, the tool would want to re remove itself from the material. It's because you get all that friction between the tool and the chip pushing in that direction. So we got a friction force, and what are we going to call the force normal to the friction force? FNT. Let's just call it N for normal to the friction force, right? And so you can draw that. So we've got a, we've got a force, so the tool, here we're drawing how the tool's working on the chip. So uh, the chip's pushing the tool that way, which means the tool has to be pushing the chip this way, right? And so I got a friction force that's directly lined up with this angle. Somebody, I didn't draw very good angles here, so. So, so this I drew my FT poorly. FT should have been straight this way. So that my friction force, and we're going to call that F for friction. And then there's a normal force, which almost lines up with, with the way I drew this, it almost lines up with the, uh, there's a normal force, normal to the friction force. Now, if you know this angle, and this angle, and I don't know, let's say this one. Could you devise equations to move from one force system to the other? As long as you knew some of the forces? Right, what, what class is it we do the systems of equations? This plus this, and, you know, which one is it? Algebra. algebra, right? So my daughter's in fifth grade and she's starting to learn algebra now. It's the new math. I actually like the new math. Don't let anybody tell you the new math is bad. It just sucked for her because they changed from the old math to the new math while she was in school. Um, but they're doing algebra stuff in fifth grade now. It's pretty cool. Who had? I, when did you guys take algebra? First experience to algebra. I was, it was seventh grade for me too. 
but now they're talking about algebra stuff. They're doing equations. They're solving for x in fifth grade. So I think that's pretty cool. Kids are smart today. Be careful. You guys are going to be, wait, so she's 10. You guys are like 20. So 10 years after you've been in industry, you're going to have had your job for 10 years. And these smart kids that learned algebra in fifth grade are going to be looking for your job. So be careful. All right. Uh, tomorrow, I did not quite get as far into this as I wanted to, but almost. I want to, we're going to, at the beginning of tomorrow, we're going to spend a couple more minutes looking at going from four system to four systems. I'm going to show you some of the systems of equations. I asked you guys if you could derive the system of equations, right? And if you knew enough of the angles, you could, right? Because it's algebra and geometry and that stuff. Who wants to? Raise your hand. Yeah, me neither. So we're going to give you some examples of what people have already figured out. And we're going to talk about how to apply those equations to solve problems in this area. Um, yeah, the last five minutes of class today, we're going to form our groups. So make sure before you come to class tomorrow, you've decided on a group of three people. Good to go? Okay.